Arthur Hugh Clough wrote a number of short poems that are still remembered a century and a quarter after his early death at the age of 41, notably his satiric The Latest Decalogue and the solemn and lofty Say Not the Struggle Nought Availeth. But I want in this short programme to concentrate on his long poem Amour de Voyage, which he wrote in Italy in 1849 and which was one of the few of his poems to be published in his lifetime. Amour de Voyage is a novel in verse, and like the epic poetry of the ancients, it is in hexameters. Either one of these conditions would be enough to cause most modern readers to keep well away from it. The novel in verse is a form that has died out completely, and now that so few people read the classics, the hexameters are likely to seem a meaningless convention, merely baffling. Nevertheless, the poem has not been forgotten. It has readers. It has admirers, of whom I am one. It is short, economical, and written throughout at a very high level of energy and intelligence. The story is told in letters, and the characters are travelling. The chief letter writer is a young man, I picture him in his mid-twenties, intelligent, well-read, evidently with no money worries, keen to improve his mind by travel, but at the same time sceptical, critical, not just drinking it all in. Clough was a brilliant student at Oxford and became a don briefly, before resigning his fellowship because of the requirements still in force at that time that you had to assent to the 39 articles. The young man is called Claude, and I suspect the poet chose that name because it's a monosyllable that begins with C-L. In other words, he is something of a mouthpiece for Clough himself. Not quite, however. Claude, though he has the agnosticism that made Clough throw up his academic career, though he has the reading and cultivation, though he has the retired and scholarly nature that Clough had, is also a bit self-conscious, a bit solemn, a trifle conceited even. His creator tends to laugh at him now and then a little, sympathetically, though, as we laugh at our own younger selves. Claude's letters are addressed to a friend at home named Eustace, and that is all we know about him, that his name is Eustace and that he is at home. We have none of his replies. The letters begin as ordinary impressions of travel. Being Claude's impressions, naturally, they are ironic, sceptical, elegantly expressed. Rome disappoints me much. I hardly as yet understand, but... Rubbishy seems the word that most exactly would suit it. All the foolish destructions and all the sillier savings, all the incongruous things of past incompatible ages seem to be treasured up here to make fools of present and future. Would to heaven the old Goths had made a cleaner sweep of it. Would to heaven some new ones would come and destroy these churches. And again... Rome disappoints me still, but I shrink and adapt myself to it. Somehow a tyrannous sense of a superincumbent oppression still, wherever I go, accompanies ever and makes me feel like a tree, shall I say, buried under a ruin of brickwork. Rome, believe me, my friend, is like its own Monte Testaccio, merely a marvellous mass of broken and castaway wine pots. Ye gods! What do I want with this rubbish of ages departed? Things that nature abhors? The experiments that she has failed in? What do I find in the forum? An archway and two or three pillars. Well, but St. Peter's? Alas, Bernini has filled it with sculpture. No one can cavil, I grant, at the size of the great Colosseum. Doubtless the notion of grand and capacious and massive amusement... This the old Romans had. But tell me, is this an idea? Presently, Claude tells Eustace that he has run into a man called George Vernon. One gathers vaguely that the three of them are Oxford acquaintances. And Vernon, though evidently the kind of man Claude would normally tend to avoid, stays in focus long enough to introduce him to a family called Trevelyan, from Cornwall, in banking or something of that sort. The Trevelyan family includes three daughters of marriageable age, Georgina, Mary and Susan. Susan, the youngest, is hardly more than a name in the story, but Georgina and Mary are defined and contrasting characters. 
Georgina, conventional, practical, wanting clear-cut decisions, especially in affairs of the heart, by which, of course, she means betrothed and matrimony, and Mary, both gentler and more intelligent, an interested spectator of life, willing to have her emotions engaged at the right time and by the right person, but not, like Georgina, perpetually on the qui vive. Georgina has her sights on George Vernon, and indeed, before the poem is over, she has him safely to the altar and off on honeymoon. And she has Claude pinpointed as a possible suitor for Mary. But although he joins their party on excursions, is polite and amiable and says the right things to parents and daughters, he doesn't, to Georgina's annoyance, make a move. And Mary, even more annoyingly, makes no attempt to cut off his retreat. Indeed, Mary's first reaction to Claude is cool. I do not like him much, though I do not dislike being with him. He is what people call, I suppose, a superior man, and certainly seems so to me. But I think he is frightfully selfish. The precise steps whereby Claude falls in love with Mary are shown sensitively and with precision. At first he is aware of coming close enough to be something more than a mere friendly acquaintance. Tenderness, the hint of a commitment, are entering the relationship. But his mental picture of himself is of a loner, one who preserves his independence and freedom, whatever happens. To form any close or closish relationship with a girl is already to look ahead to the day when it will have to be broken. But I am in for it now. Laissez-faire of a truth. Laissez-aller. Yes, I am going. I feel it. I feel and cannot recall it fusing with this thing and that, entering into all sorts of relations. Tying I know not what ties, which, whatever they are, I know one thing, will and must, woe is me, be one day painfully broken. Broken with painful remorses, with shrinkings of soul and relentings, foolish delays, more foolish evasions, most foolish renewals. Before long, however, as an alert reader will have foreseen from the start, Claude has got himself in deeply enough not to want to get out. But meanwhile, other matters crowd in on the attention of the characters. This is a time of revolutions all over Europe, and for Italy the beginnings of the Risorgimento, and they have arrived in Rome just at the time when the people of that city have declared a republic and are trying to light their own little straw in the torch of Italian freedom. So, as the characters of Amour de Voyage wander about the Eternal City, look at the buildings and frescoes and marbles, and speculate about their relationships with one another, a French army arrives at the gates. The French had, for reasons I am not a good enough historian to know, constituted themselves the main protectors of the papacy, and when, in 1849, the anti-clerical bias of the nascent republic began to show itself so markedly that Pope Pius IX judged it prudent to leave Rome, the French became rattled and sent an expeditionary force. Claude, walking round with the famous guidebook published by John Murray, dutifully absorbing the past, finds himself witnessing a piece of the present. Yes, we are fighting at last, it appears. This morning, as usual, Murray, as usual in hand, I enter the Café Nuovo. Seating myself with a sense, as it were, of a change in the weather, not understanding, however, but thinking mostly of Murray, and, for today is their day, of the Campidoglio marbles, Café Latte, I call to the waiter, and Non c'è Latte. This is the answer he makes me, and this the sign of a battle. So I sit, and truly they seem to think anyone else more worthy than me of attention. I wait for my milkless Nero, free to observe undistracted all sorts and sizes of persons, blending civilian and soldier in strangest costume, coming in and gulping in hottest haste, still standing their coffee, withdrawing eagerly, jangling a sword on the steps, or jogging a musket slung to the shoulder behind. They are fewer, moreover, than usual, much, and silent afar. And so I begin to imagine something is really afloat. Ere I leave, the café is empty. 
empty too the streets, in all its length the corso empty, and empty I see to my right and left the condotti. Perhaps what such a passage actually reveals is the peacefulness of 19th century English life. Claude is witnessing armed struggle on a small scale, whose outcome can hardly concern him. A tiny city-state fighting for something that it thinks politically desirable, rather than desperate resistance against an obvious evil. His feelings might be different if he were watching, say, the defence of the Warsaw Ghetto. But Clough, in his ordered century, could not be blamed for never imagining that such things could be. The most extreme case Clough can think of is having to defend an English lady against an undisciplined soldiery. Now, supposing the French or the Neapolitan soldier should by some evil chance come exploring the Maison Cerny, where the family English are all to assemble for safety, am I prepared to lay down my life for the British female? Really, who knows? One has bowed and talked till, little by little, all the natural heat has escaped of the chivalrous spirit. Oh, one conformed, of course. But one doesn't die for good manners, stab or shoot or be shot by way of graceful attention. No, if it should be at all, it should be on the barricades there. Should I incarnadine ever this inky pacifical finger, sooner far should it be for this vapour of Italy's freedom, sooner far by the side of the damned and dirty plebeians. Ah, for a child in the street I could strike. For the full-blown lady, somehow, Eustace, alas, I have not felt the vocation. We mustn't suppose that Clough couldn't see the humour of this lukewarm reaction on his hero's part. Common civility is a comical phrase to use in this connection, and Clough knows it is comical. Clough himself, in fact, is not quite in line with his character Claude here. Speaking in his own voice, in one of the linking, non-dramatic passages, that are marked out by being written in elegiacs rather than epic hexameters, he has a beautiful reflection on that breath of ancient nobility, that faint hint of the survival of a more large-scale version of humanity, that so many people, deluded or not, have felt in Rome as they have felt it in Athens. Is it illusion? Or does there a spirit from perfecter ages, here even yet, amid loss, change and corruption, abide? Does there a spirit we know not, though seek, though we find, comprehend not, here to entice and confuse, tempt and evade us, abide? Lives in the exquisite grace of the column disjointed and single, haunts the rude masses of brick, garlanded gaily with fine. E'en in the turret fantastic, surviving that springs from the ruin. E'en in the people itself, is it illusion or not? Is it illusion or not that attracteth the pilgrim transalpine? Brings him a dullard and dunce, hither to pry and to stare? Is it illusion or not that allures the barbarian stranger? Brings him with gold to the shrine? Brings him in arms to the gate?